Our gospel lesson this morning will come from the 12th chapter of Mark, verses 38 to 44. This is on page 38 in the New Testament half of the Pew Bible. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory be to thee, thee O Lord. Lord. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, thee Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The first time that I studied this lesson and prepared for this time of year in, in a church service, I had to laugh a little bit. You know that this is the story of the widow's offering. What made me laugh is right away I thought to myself, for the average everyday preacher, this is the easiest and most perfect sermon to put together for this time of year. Why? Because it's a sermon about money, and it's specifically a sermon where we can talk about someone giving all they have. That is a preacher's delight, is to talk to everybody about giving all that they have. So as I started going through the notes and the commentaries that I have, I found out I'm not the only one who can laugh at this because some of my colleagues joked about how sermons about money can also get preachers really passionate and really animated and make an even bigger impression on the congregation and that times with about the time their job reviews are coming up. So you can see how all of that comes together. But these same notes and commentaries do have a warning. It's a warning to not fall into this trap about talking about money and giving and whatnot. Because the heart of Jesus' teaching in this lesson has little to do with money. And it has plenty to do with our outlook on life as people of faith. We need to set the scene a little bit for today's lesson before we delve into that teaching that I just mentioned. If you haven't guessed already, Jesus and the disciples are at the temple in Jerusalem and Mark has positioned them there in the aftermath of the incident where Jesus cleanses the temple. Now you'll recall that this is the incident where Jesus drove out those who were selling and buying on temple grounds and he overturned the tables of the money changers. After that, he went head to head with the scribes and the temple leadership on his authority and on his teachings and you'll recall how he handily escaped their efforts to entrap him in the words he was using in his teachings. Here is where he also dazzled the crowds, and keep in mind he dazzled his own disciples with his wit 
and with his brutal truth telling. Jesus called out those who were participants in political and religious corruption and gave kudos to a scribe who demonstrated wisdom in the midst of all that nonsense that was going on. So to emphasize, our lesson today is in the aftermath of all these dramatic encounters. And here specifically in our lesson today, we find Jesus taking a break from hours of engagement and sitting on the sideline to do something I like to do, people watch. Jesus is taking a break from the drama. He's sitting on the sideline and he's people watching. He taught the crowds and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched, is what Mark's gospel tell us, tells us. And Jesus didn't people watch just to entertain himself after putting in a day's work. Instead, he focused his attention on those who were putting money into the temple treasury. When he turned his gaze to the treasury, who did he see? Jesus saw a woman who would ordinarily be invisible to the average person in this busy place amidst all the wealthy individuals who were coming up and tossing in large amounts of coins into the jars that held the offerings. This woman was practically invisible. Amidst the crowds who had just listened to and delighted in Jesus' teachings, this was a woman who, for lack of better terms, kind of flew under the radar. She was invisible even to the disciples whom Jesus had to call over so he could point her out to them. It's no accident that Jesus saw a widow and made her visible to those who who were ignoring her. Widows are made visible to us throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and among the references to widows throughout Scripture, we find that God either commands his people to care for them or the Lord castigates people for failing to have compassion on them. In the cultural context of these Scriptures, Women who had lost their husbands were automatically a high-risk sector. A woman who became a widow could easily and unintentionally fall into poverty. The absence of a husband made her immeasurably more vulnerable to that particular fate. It was Jesus who, only a few verses earlier, warned against the self-serving scribes who devour widows' houses. He was describing a painful reality of this day and time in his earthly ministry. A woman without a male protector and provider could be forced into debt more easily by the very flawed legal and economic systems in place. Understanding this little bit about the poor widow's social context gives us a different entry point into this story. Typically, we see this widow as an outstanding model for sacrificial giving, and there's truth to that. And that's why preachers like to use this lesson about the time the church is getting ready to write its annual budget for next year. But here's the ironic thing. Jesus does not praise her, nor does he praise her money offering. Jesus doesn't claim that we should all follow her example of giving money. He doesn't use her offering to deliver a sermon on the virtues of tithing and stewardship. He doesn't deliver a lecture 
on the importance of supporting the treasury, but rather Jesus notice her, notices her and comments on her participation in a society that had turned its eyes away from her plight. We are reminded of God's line of sight. In God's line of sight, widows and all of those who have needs and concerns are brought forward even if these folks are invisible to others. There's a special place in God's line of sight for people whose lives and situations are not only problematic, but who are not visible, especially when everybody else are distracted by everyday concerns of life. And this is where we start talking about our outlook on life as Christians. Jesus taught his disciples to observe the people rather than observe the crowd. Or figuratively, Jesus is teaching us the importance of seeing the trees rather than the forest. What do we mean by that? Jesus calls us as people of faith, as his followers, to change our outlook, shift our vantage point, and turn our attention away from larger distractions so that we see the suffering of people who might otherwise be invisible to us. It's not easy, nor is it comfortable to see who God sees. When we open our eyes to the suffering of others, we see people in situations that take us out of our comfort zone. When we think of people who are in need, we have a tendency to think about people who show up at food pantries or people who call the church to see if they can get money to pay utility bills. Or in the cultural context of Mark's gospel, we can think about the beggars who stood at the gates of the temple with their hands out. It's easy for us and people like us to volunteer at something like a soup kitchen or for churches like us to budget money for relief ministries. And God honors our hearts and our giving. But today's lesson in Mark is going much deeper than that. God is calling us to see the needs of people who are not necessarily visible to us. As I studied this lesson, my mind kept going to a place in Tennessee that we don't like to talk about and that we don't like to mention in conversation and that we really would rather pretend does not exist. I'm going to tell what it is, and you'll squirm a little when I say it. I'm going to talk about that place known as Moccasin Bend. Here's a place that you can see as you're driving to Chattanooga, but you don't want to see what's on the inside. As a Tennessean, I, like so many others who live in this state, have always treated that place as a taboo subject. You just don't talk about it. You don't want to know who's there or why they are there, and you really don't want to go inside and see what goes on there. The reason it came to mind when I read this lesson is because the Lord taught me years ago the importance of seeing the need of people who would otherwise be invisible. Years ago when I worked at the university, I was given the unfortunate task of taking someone to that facility to check herself in. And I'll spare you the details of that because that was an extremely difficult situation, but I learned a lot about it. Prior to my visit there, as I mentioned, the people in that facility were completely invisible to me. 
I did not know their needs. I did not know their situations. And with that, I had no compelling reason to even uphold them in my prayers or to reach out to people who might need a place like that. But after being on the inside, after seeing and observing the people who live there, my outlook changed. And it changed in a good way, even though the means for that change were extremely difficult. Jesus calls us to sit with him for a moment, watch, and observe. As Christians, we need to broaden our scope, look beyond the obvious, and see the need for God's mercy in people who may not be visible to us. As the holidays approach, we will enter a time of year when people of all ages, all walks of life, poor, rich, and in between, suffer in silence. There are people all around us, regardless of their walk of life or their status, who will not be able to to have a joyful feast of Thanksgiving or Christmas tide because they may have lost a loved one recently and are still grieving, or there could be another life tragedy that has brought an unbearable darkness into their lives. Jesus calls us to see and observe needs like that that aren't readily visible and more importantly, to share God's mercy, to comfort those whose life situations are problematic and complicated. And especially when their situations are not visible to the average person. God became manifest in Jesus <coughs> not only to offer us the beautiful gift of eternal life, but to also bring our attention to those who are invisible and whose needs in life are even less visible. We simply need to change our outlook. Amen. Amen. Amen.